financial troubles. It is a major source of stress for many young people today, with stagnating wages, increasing life costs, and sky-high student loans. Many find themselves wracked with mountains of debt. In fact, more and more people are having to resort to extreme measures just to get out of their financial issues. Whether it's getting multiple jobs, declaring bankruptcy, begging on the streets, hell, some might even be willing to risk their lives joining the Squid Games. But what if I told you that all you had to do was become a J-pop star? Introducing Japan's poorest girl group, the Margarines. Boasting a combined net worth of negative $1.2 million, this was a group that consisted of 9 women who were all selected for the one thing they shared in common, crippling personal debt. Formed in 2014, the Margarines debuted with the ambitious aim of singing and dancing their way out of the $1.2 million of debt, truly living up to the group's motto that even people with big debts have big dreams. But 8 years on, did the group actually manage to accomplish their hefty goals? And where are the members today? Well, to find out, I obviously had to reach out to one of the Margarines themselves. Hi, my name is Marie. I'm 30. I'm from Germany. And from 2014, I've been a member of the idol group called the Margarines in Japan. But before we go any further, I myself need to clear my bills by thanking today's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN. So these days, I never go online without switching on my CyberGhost VPN. And there's so many reasons for this. Firstly, a VPN or a virtual private network is a great cybersecurity tool. It creates a secure tunnel for all your internet traffic so that things like your IP addresses, usernames, and passwords are kept safe from hackers and other people who might be trying to access your data. And I just think it's so important, especially if you're like me and you like going to places like cafes and libraries where you connect to public unsecured Wi-Fi. But what I find even more exciting is that a VPN allows you to virtually travel the globe and use the internet as if you're located in a different country. This means that you're able to access websites, TV shows, and games that may not be available in your region. So to give you an example, I recently wanted to watch House of Dragons, which sadly wasn't available here in Hong Kong. But I knew it was available in the US, so all I had to do was open up the CyberGhost app and with just one click, I was able to change my location to the US where sure enough, I found a show on HBO Max. As you can see, CyberGhost VPN comes with so many benefits and it's also super convenient and easy to use. But best of all, they're currently offering all of you viewers an exclusive discount at just $2.23 a month plus 4 months free. And the subscription also comes with 24-7 customer service and a 45-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Be sure to check out CyberGhost using the link in the description. And without further ado, let's jump back into the video. So the year was 2014, and as you guys may or may not know, Japan had actually been going through a really long and drawn out economic crisis. Debts were at an all time high, wages had stagnated for over a decade, and with up to 30% of the population being past retirement age, young people in the country were left dealing with more economic burden and financial instability than ever. So what better time than now to use the struggling Japanese youth for a business venture? Said famous comedian Kayoko Obuko and director McCoy Saito. And hence, the idea of an in-debt idol group was born, offering a chance for the financially destitute to turn their lives around and repay their debts by becoming J-pop idols. Posters advertising the auditions were distributed across Japan, featuring promising phrases like Get money! Repay your debts with dreams! Go from the lowest point in your life to the highest! The criteria to join the auditions was firstly to be female, secondly to be between the ages of 18 to 35, and last but most importantly, to be in debt. Singing and dancing skills? Psh, those were optional. With such alluring advertising and probably the lowest job requirements in history, it really was no surprise that over 500 struggling women from all walks of life reportedly turned up at the auditions. Like when we were doing the audition, they didn't care if you could sing or dance, you just had to be funny. So basically for, my, for me, for example, I was dancing. 
uh-huh. and they suddenly would ask me a question a question while I was dancing <laughs> And so they wanted to see how I would react and I was like, oh, whatever. And I kept dancing while answering the question. And apparently that they like that so right. much. That, so I also, it was more to like test your reaction to like different situations than your yeah. actual skills. Yes, yes. Because like I can't dance and I can't sing, but I still got oh. the job just because like, you know, the big white girl. Who speaks as a few languages. It wasn't until September that year that the member lineup was finally confirmed and the group was introduced to the public for the first time. Idol no group me, kochira des! The Margarines! Why the margarines, you might ask? Well, because what this group was doing was in essence much like fake butter. Apparently, the reason behind the name was because we were not a real idol group, right? We, we, were, we didn't really have a great singer, we didn't have great dancers. So right. as margarine is fake butter, we were fake idols. That's where the name is from. Naturally, the members' debt problems were a main talking point, with all nine women proudly announcing how they each fell into such hard economic times. Examples include group leader Akino Fujiwara, who owed 7 million yen in student loans, Yakino Shita, who owed 3 million yen after one too many trips to spas and amusement parks, Natsumi Watanabe who had been tricked out of 8 million yen due to a scam, and the group's most indebted member Mami Nishida who was 100 million yen in the red after her family's business went bankrupt. In total, the group had racked up a cumulative debt of 127 million yen, something which would of course be loudly displayed across a live counter on the group's official website, allowing fans to keep track of just how much debt each member still owed in real time. Unsurprisingly, the group turned heads thanks to their eccentric concept, making it to headline news across various J-pop websites. Seeing the amount of media attention that the Margarines was getting, an ambitious target was set for the group to sell at least 10,000 albums, which was a tall ask for an underground J-pop group. However, director McCoy Saito remained confident in the Margarines, remarking, These women have nothing to lose, and their shot at redemption will enable them to work harder than other idols. And yeah, sure, they had nothing to lose. As a matter of fact, they pretty much had nothing going for them at all. But with no money, no dignity, and no singing and dancing skills, could hard work alone be enough to help this group accomplish their hefty goals? I guess only time can tell. In October of 2014, after less than a month of preparation, the group finally made their debut, beginning their journey to financial recovery with the song Goodbye Dead Heaven. This song was heavily promoted, with the group doing live performances in some of Japan's biggest venues for over two months. This was followed up in April of 2015 with the group's comeback album, which consisted of the songs Sakura is Sakura and May There Be Five Yet. Aside from releasing music, the group also kept busy with other activities, regularly attending fan meets, holding weekly live streams, and posting frequently on their Twitter and Amiibo blogs. The group also released a DVD set documenting the auditioning and training process, had an ongoing reality TV show which aired every Wednesday, on top of various other TV and radio show appearances. Clearly, the girls were working as hard as they could, just like director Saito had predicted. And so you would think that with such a busy schedule and so many promotional activities, surely the girls would have generated a ton of income, right? We didn't end up making money at all. Money. So it turns out that behind the busy schedule and the countless activities, the margarines were actually struggling behind the scenes. Yes, they might have initially made headlines thanks to their outrageous concept, but as you may have predicted, nobody actually took them seriously as a group. Most people simply had a quick laugh and then moved on instead of actually becoming dedicated fans. In fact, by the time the margarines debuted, public interest in them had already faded, and so few fans turned up to their live events that they couldn't even cover 
recover costs, and we're in fact losing money from each and every single performance. Like actually, we the whole project did lose money, especially in the beginning for the first CD release. We did a lot of release events, and we did them at like really famous places where actual idol like K-pop like. BTS. You know, I don't know if you know Odaiba, but it's like this really famous spot, and every K-pop idol group does events there. Okay, we went there too, but like the thing is, it's really expensive to rent the place, and we barely had like thirty, forty people showing up. So when your concert has a lower turnout rate than a uni lecture, that's when you know things are not going well. The group's albums also tanked. With their first and second album peaking at number 160 and 172 on the Oricon charts respectively, and as for their sales target of 10,000 albums, well, for our first single we sell sold about 2,000, and then for our second one I think we sold even less. The group was clearly not doing as well as their company had expected. And so the members suggested cutting costs and using cheaper Gruella marketing tactics to get their name out there instead. However, these ideas were rejected by director Saito and their company. So I think like one of the biggest reasons is because it's such a big uh, agency. Like they were, for example, K-pop, they do BTS, they do B1A4, or at least in the, pa in the past they did. So but they were, they are so used to managing bigger groups. So they didn't really know what to do with us. So when we were like, okay, we need more people coming to our events. Let's hand out flyers. Like we actually agreed to do it ourselves. Like let's hand out flyers. Let's like get the people to know about us. They were like, no, 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 that's not how we do things here. Here. So yeah. they, they stopped us from trying to get the word out to people because they, they just weren't used to having idols starting at zero. Right, so they were like creating an underground idol group, but they weren't marketing it like an underground idol group. It's basically exactly. Essentially, it seems like director Saito believed that marketing tactics like busking or passing out flyers were beneath his artists. What was apparently not beneath the girls though, was being forced to strip and getting slapped on screen for laughs. Now, if you recall, I mentioned earlier that the group held a weekly live stream, which actually went on for almost two years, during which they would play games and interact with their audience. And this live stream all seemed like good fun on the surface. After all, what's funnier than seeing a bunch of girls get pushed around on screen? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But in reality, it turns out things were not quite as enjoyable behind the scenes, especially when director Saito was on set. Uh, our producer was a really famous TV show producer, and he would sometimes come onto the show as well. Right. And everyone hated it when he came. It was so scary. There was this like rule whenever he comes to the show, bring your bikini because he's going to make you take off your clothes. What? <laughs> and he loved to slap or hit people. So each member had their own part, right? Yeah. Like, I was the weird foreigner, and then we had this one girl who was always being slapped. So I when saw... he would come on the show, the dancer, yeah. yeah, Miku, like, she was in charge of being slapped. So whenever he would come, he would slap her. And he would get mad if she, like, faked it or if she tried to avoid it. Like, she would actually have to take the hit. And he thought that was funny. Wow. Like, so like their reason That's was like, you don't have money, you you have to do whatever we tell you to like. Wow, that's if you want to repay your debt, you have to go to all levels. The fact that the management used the women's debt problems to basically force them into doing compromising activities on screen is obviously super messed up and unacceptable. But if they were going to threaten the women like that, then surely the live stream must have been bringing in a ton of cash, right? Like, surely there must have been a lot of money at stake for the women, right? Well, what if I told you that the live stream never even generated a dime and the girls weren't even getting paid? So did you guys even generate money from the live stream? No. No. So it, it, that was basically volunteer work from our side. We did that once a week and we did not see a single penny for that. Wait, so even the company didn't make any money? Like I thought you can give gifts like on Twitch, you know, the donations and stuff. I think you can if the host allows you to. But they didn't even but allow. But I think our... I don't think they did. 
I just know that we never got money. <laughs> I mean, not that it makes it okay, but the fact that the company made the girls do all of that and didn't even think to charge viewers for it, it's just <laughs> so unbelievably stupid. Like, even normal streamers and cam girls are smarter than that. Needless to say, since there was no money involved, there was literally zero incentives for the members to attend the streams, especially since many of them were already in financial trouble and would have rather spent that time doing jobs that actually paid. At one point, I was just fed up with it. I was like, I cannot waste one day a week without getting paid because yeah. like, I have to finance my living, right? And so I would skip the internet show actually a few times to do paid work. They didn't really like that. Because they were like, you're a member of this group, you have to join right. us. I was like, yeah, but you're not paying me. <laughs> I just think it's so funny how in this whole situation, the members who were supposed to be the ones who were, you know, in debt and bad at finance were ironically making way better financial decisions than their management. Like, at least they were finding ways to actually earn some income. But yeah, with such a terrible company in charge, it was just a matter of time before the margarines as a group failed completely. By late 2015, things had only gone further downhill for the margarines. It was clear that something needed to be done. And so in a desperate attempt to rebrand, the J-pop idol group was transformed into a comedy troupe instead. And their name was likewise changed to Gekidan Margarines, which translates in English to the theater margarines. So they were trying to keep going with the group without losing more money and producing music is expensive. So they thought, oh, okay. I mean, we started this group as a comedy group anyway. Let's just make them do comedy lights or acting instead. And that's basically how it changed. This continued for almost a year, with the Gekidan margarines continuing to make more financial losses along the way. Funnily enough, it seemed that the group's slogan, even people with big debts have big dreams, didn't exactly apply to the founders, Abuko and Saito, who finally decided to cut their financial losses and give up on the group in September of 2016, disbanding the Gekidan margarines after they failed to sell enough tickets to one of their live shows. But the shit show didn't even end there, because after the disbandment, director Saito allegedly forced all the members to audition for another J-pop group he worked with called the Abyssu Muscats, which is a sexy group known for having members who were porn stars and gravier models. So actually they made us, uh, you know, when like while we were still doing the margarines, our whole group had to audition for Abyssu Muscats as well. Oh, because I and saw like a half few... of our members actually. Right, yeah, yeah I saw a few of them actually. Did... Well. Wait, so all of you had to audition, like you had no choice. Yeah, I had. Yeah, I auditioned for that as well, despite wow. not wanting to do it because well, like, they actually job. take their clothes off a lot. Wow. I luckily did. <laughs> I luckily did not get into that group, <laughs> and I was really happy about that, honestly. To be fair, the Abyss and Whisk Cats was a very successful J-pop group, and there were apparently a few members who were more than happy to join. But the fact that all the members were forced to audition even if they weren't comfortable with the concept is yet another example of how the management exploited these women time and time again. But luckily, Marie was able to escape the situation and has since migrated to Korea. 2018, I came over to Korea. Oh. And I went to university here, and now I'm I'm working. And oh, so you're no longer in living the, the normal life. <laughs> As for the other members, some of them still seem to be pursuing a career in the J-pop industry, while others seem to have moved on to other career paths. But regardless, I can only hope that all of them have since resolved their debt issues and are in a better place today. So that concludes the story of one of J-pop's weirdest girl groups, the Margarines. Although the members did not manage to repay their debts, and the experience seemed pretty horrible overall, Marie says she still doesn't look back at her time in the group with any regrets. It was a really weird and really special uh, experience. That it's something I can tell my children and grandchildren at some point because it's something so special not every person has a chance to experience. So looking back at it, I'm, I'm really happy I did it. But at the right. same time, I'm, I'm really happy it's over. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious to know what you guys think. 
Do you think the margarines were doomed from the start? Or was there some way this group could have actually succeeded? Let me know in the comments. Also, huge thanks to Marie for participating in this interview. She's actually looking to relaunch her YouTube channel and possibly even get back into the entertainment industry. So that's super exciting and I'll definitely encourage you guys to check out her social media and offer her your support. Last but not least, thank you to CyberGhost for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to grab their exclusive deal today by clicking on the link in the description. And with that said, I'll see you guys soon. Bye! Thank you for watching, and special thanks to my Patreon members. If you'd like to watch bonus content such as my full interview with Marie, then be sure to check that out on my Patreon.